It's always a satisfying experience to watch your colonies grow and expand in RimWorld, like peering down for a close-up view of an anthill and marveling at the bustling hive, overflowing with activity. To more directly visualize my colony's progress, I undertook a new RimWorld challenge. To survive underground, completely cut off from the normal game world, and encased in miles upon miles of solid rock with a single colonist. I chose a pawn who wouldn't break under the pressure of being entombed in Earth, and who might stand an honest chance against the sheer brute force that this challenge demanded. I gave him a name overflowing with majesty, Seymour Butts, and I embarked upon my expedition. On the first day, I knew I had to set down a few points so that I could keep coming back to them. My ultimate goal? Dig out a thriving underground metropolis for myself with everything a normal colonist would have access to in the sunlight. That meant a few things. One, establishing a renewable food source and production benches to sustain myself. Two, fortifying my cavern with a basic security system for many insects that might infest it. And three, dig my way out from underneath the mountain so that I could eventually leave my underground shelter, or more importantly, establish a potential trade route for anyone who wanted to visit my colony. I knew that living under a mountain would lend itself to a sense of timelessness if I didn't adhere to a strict regimen, so the first point on my agenda was to set out my daily schedule to demand a block of work and at least an hour of rest each day. That would help me keep track of time. I spent most of day one mining out the basic structure of my home. Right away, I had to plant some neutrofungus on the ground beneath me. It would take a while to grow, and I had only ten meals beneath me to start. That was all that I had. I slept on the floor that night, quiet, alone, and in the dark. On the second day, I began to strip mine the walls around me. It was essential that I should scour as much surface area as possible throughout the mine if I was to uncover any steel, an extremely valuable resource for building and industrialization. I made my strip mining symmetrical to work evenly throughout. The sun rose and set and I toiled from dawn to dusk, tilling the ground with gravel for neutrofungus, further increasing my chances at survival once the meals ran out. I planted the last few spores and then I retired once again only to sleep on the ground beneath my feet. I still needed a bed and more permanent lodging, though. The third day. Not much else happened on this day. I continued planting, and I farther widened the spread of my strip mines. At the end of the day, I finally gave myself an allowance of a small hollow in the wall in which to sleep for the night. It was better than sleeping on the gravel, and I'd definitely be down here for a while. Day four. I didn't have many choices. Every single square of ground beneath my feet had to be a bed of growth and sustainment. Soon, my gloomy cavern would evolve into something of a life preservation chamber. I mined further and established specialized chambers in the cavern. One room for mushrooms, one room for stone chunks, one room for stockpiling goods. I slept and I worked, day and night, cleaning, fastidious in my chores. But before long, I was down to my very last meal. I tidied the cavern and busied myself. They say idleness is the devil's workshop. And if I could do anything to distract myself from the onsetting starvation, I would. So I set my house in order while the neutrofungus ripened to begin my new diet. After those last few meals, I'd be eating nothing but neutrofungus for a long, long time. While my present circumstances were anything but exciting, there wasn't a dull moment. I needed to stay organized. Every square of ground tilled increased the chance that I would survive and emerge from that cavern transformed. Mining was a constant grind, and just a week into my expedition I had already gained five levels in mining, just to wring out all the potential from that cavern at sustaining life. Indeed, things were getting weirder and weirder in my underground world. A little universe unto itself with everything I needed. Fungus that needed darkness to grow, fiber corn that needed light to grow, and the growing, gnawing concern of malnutrition punctuated only by anxious and productive excursions deeper and deeper into the mountain. I was beginning to unearth new types of stone. The brown of granite replaced the blue of the marble with which I had grown accustomed, and I staved off the threat of hunger only by eating underripe mushrooms. It would sustain me until the time came for a full, grand harvest in my warm little cavern under the mountain. But this weird backward world had become for me a home. I busied myself a little while longer until I finally reached the end of the circle. My crops had grown enough to consume and it would tide me over. I had accomplished my first goal and I knew jubilation on that day, for I had, by the sweat of my brow, sustained myself on the little soil I had tilled out of the cavern floor. Mushrooms sustained my body and an iron will sustained my mind. And despite the plethora of negative effects I was experiencing, I began to unearth yet more new and diabolical contraptions hidden within the mountain. 
among them some fossilized machinery I could mine out from the very walls themselves. Now commenced the second major phase of my goals, advancing and industrializing the sources of sustaining my quality of life. I could build, produce, automate, and fabricate machines to help facilitate my survival in that otherwise inhospitable subterranean world. Day 13 began, and my optimism mounted, with the stones arranged in orderly fashion in one hollow, and the mushrooms growing in another, that left me just enough space to start harvesting and packing away mushrooms into storage. I was a little unit of society, freeing up labor from day-to-day -day gathering in order to accomplish more important long-term tasks, namely, digging my way deeper under the mountain, fashioning building materials from raw resources, and fabricating some makeshift weapons for self-defense. About two weeks into my expedition, at the dawn of the 15th day, there was a blight on the fiber corn. Anything less than fast, decisive action to beat the blight back would have spelled swift doom. So as a reaction, to broaden my horizons beyond my little cavern and give myself an honest shot at survival in case the soil beneath my feet should betray me, I struck deeper into the mountain, and there I uncovered the most unlikely of natural cave formations sprawling an alien in the underdark. Among the winding turns and dead end, there was fresh water. I hadn't seen any in weeks. Majestic woody-stemmed fungal growths and alien insects. They made natural guardians for the resource for which I had been searching all this time. Steel. There in the mountain. But there was still yet more. Glow stools. And what appeared to be the remains of a conflict between the insects and the mechanoids. So much to explore. So much still yet to unearth. The possibilities were endless, mysterious, and exciting. And as much as my anticipation led me on, I had to retreat back to my cavern and prepare. There were some rock ruins nearby I set about deconstructing. A generous supply of resources. I could use this to keep the mega spider at bay. I waited till nightfall. While it lay there asleep, I mined out the steel in the wall, quietly. I even stole some insect jelly while it was there. With a generous haul of 81 steel, I returned home. Now I had enough resources just to get started. The first item I fashioned was a horseshoe pin for some entertainment, for there wasn't any down here. The rest of my tasks I began to automate away and organize. After that, I set out to cut down some of the timber shrooms. This would provide wood, a much needed resource, the likes of which I wouldn't find anywhere else. Before nightfall, I added it to my stock. Piles. As it turned out, there was a whole world of subterranean timber shrooms. They were abundant down there, abundant as they were in the outdoor world. That and I kept taking copious amounts of insect jelly, unbeknownst to the mega spider. He had actually been helping me. With the insect jelly filling my belly, I was fully satisfied, and for the first time in a long time, content. But I wouldn't know rest until I had processed all of the resources down here. What if some assailants descended upon my cave? What would I do then? I harvested the last of the timber shrooms, obtaining copious wood. At long last, that delivery was enough to start a workbench. In the night, I toiled to begin my new stone processing project. The work began. I would spend a long, long time making stone bricks. But it would finally give me plenty, the likes of which I hadn't known since I got down into the cavern. There, it took me three days, working and working. But I fashioned all the stone chunks into usable building materials. Just as I predicted at the outset, my progress was evident. With the last of the resources tucked away and processed, I could now move on to more essential building projects. I decided to give myself a proper bedroom, as well as a small chamber for a chemfuel powered generator. And it was safe. Having reached the natural caves, I was exposed to the outdoor air. There were a few shafts leading up to the outer sky. Along with that, I built my bed, and I fashioned a door from some granite. A reliable, stoic entryway. After that, it was mostly just a matter of hauling in the necessary materials for fuel. But as it stood, there was something of a startup cost. To get biofuel refining working, I would rely on wood first. With the wood-fired generator completed, I could kickstart my way back into action and I could keep the first generator for backup. With power running, I could produce natural resources I had obtained in the cave, now in the safety of my own home. I smoothed the walls and wired them together. The first planting of the fiber corn, growing by artificial means. Now I had the avail of all those modern conveniences, coolers, airlocks, things we depend on. I greeted this phase with a major sense of accomplishment, sure, but also prudence about keeping realistic expectations. I was only one man as it stood, and to confront the unknown floodgates of nature with such open arms would be foolhardy. So I hardened my resolve, and I got back to work. As it stood, only a thin layer of rock stood between me and any potential invaders who might, 
As I considered it, thunder their way through the air shafts dotting the mountain roof that lay overhead. What resources could I leverage for personal defense? In short, loads of marble. I had control of the hallways, and I could just place these wherever I needed if a threat were to arrive. It was a great way to grind out the last few levels of construction. I fashioned another lamp for my crafting room, and I created a crafting spot to make some simple stone weapons. A basic club would do for now. Life became calm, quiet, and refined again. I had accomplished the second of my goals. I had security. Maybe not much of it, but certainly I could fight a few mega spiders or a small raid. I had a weapon. Now the feelings of urgency gave way to a modern day on Wii. A feeling we greet with sickly familiarity. I cleaned and I looked for chores to do throughout my home. I had come so far and accomplished so much, and yet I still felt a sense of malaise, like I was merely surviving, hiding inside of my cavern for safety. I'd need to harness the geothermal powers of the mountain around me and bring the fight to my enemy's lair if I were to truly claim mastery of the mountain around me. One man harnessing the power of technology to leverage nature in a fight for survival. I had accomplished my first goal, certainly. I now had a surplus of resources to survive indefinitely and hide in my cavern, and probably survive a while. But to to really feel strong, I'd have to bring the fight to my enemies and carve a path out of that mountain to claim victory. I mined deeper into the cavern, and there beneath the shafts of light that extended from the sky, I uncovered a geothermal vent. This demanded mining some of the space around it, all marble. Exposed to the open air, there would be just enough room for one, and I could connect it back to my power grid. But such an undertaking required resources. I decided to lay a trap for the mega spider. Although my feeble human body was significantly weaker, I leveraged reason and use my mind. I could plan for the fight. And so I did, snaring him in my traps. But I paid a heavy price. It had cut off two of my toes. Two of my toes I had paid for safety. I carried back the corpse of the beast and rejoiced. I destroyed that abomination of a nest. The mega spider would not be missed. And there was jubilation when I returned with steel. Now I would have power. My movement recovered and I accepted a life with only eight toes left. Now labor commenced on the power lines, and I would have enough to undertake construction on a geothermal power generator. The preparations were complete. I utilized it in constructing the geothermal generator. Now we could harness the sublime power of the earth that had entrapped us. And by the end of the 15th of September, we had more power than we'd ever need. But where to put all that power to best use in my home? Fiber corn grew well in light, but if we added a sun lamp, it would simply flourish. The technological boom sent my confidence soaring, and I mined yet deeper still. There I chanced upon the forbidden chambers of the ancients, and yet so near to the map edge, so near to the finish line. The mysterious ruins of an ancient underground tomb, secret arco technology, hidden there deep under the mountain. I had come all this way to discover psychic pulsers. There I unlocked the remains of some mercenaries trapped inside the tomb. Dormant. I opened the tomb. One was hostile, and it was a mad fight. Shotguns and clubs, tooth and nail, I clawed my way to victory with my awesome mastery of the club. Even without my toes, I was a savage killer. In the confusion that ensued, it was an awesome display of manly ferocity. I left the marine dead, and in the words of Lewis Carroll, I went galumphing back. Oh, frab just dead. Kalu Kalei. I had proven my virility in mortal combat, and I increased. And grabbing myself a nice plate of Luciferium, I would have my toes back. Luciferium would allow me to regenerate those toes I had lost, and I equipped it myself. A few days later, clad in marine armor, I mined my way out into the wider world. Toes restored and all, for I had overcome the mountain. I was a new man, and I could go on to live in greener fields and pastures new. For it is not the destination, but the journey, and the personal transformation that made it worthwhile. But it was a fun challenge, I learned a lot. You can get by without almost anything in RimWorld if you know what you're doing. Again and again, inviting creativity and a sense of adventure. I'm Ambiguous Amphibian. Until we meet again.